ha, 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 ha. Look what we have here. It is an all electric Peugeot E de. No, that's the limit of my French. It's a Peugeot E208, a French electric car. And isn't it striking? First and foremost, price and range. This piece of magnificence will set you back just north of 55 grand after the clean car rebate. And for that, you get a very usable 382 Ks per charge. But take a look at it. It's pretty striking, right? Looks kind of like a hot hatch. So my question is, do the specifications, and I'm so sorry to any French speakers, do the specifications match the looks? I'm looking forward to finding out because the interior is the same. Sporty seats and an angry angular dashboard complement a racing flavored leather steering wheel and low slung seating, all adding up to the feeling that it's a serious hot hatch. It has heaps of gadgetry too, like the 10 inch 3D eye cockpit display, which is configurable, funky dashboard piano keys, wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, voice recognition, two USB ports in the front and two in the back, and it comes with a granny charger as standard. It also has 17 inch diamond cut alloy wheels, anti-pinch electric windows, and automatic proximity unlocking, though it didn't seem to like me. It must have met me. As for room, I'm 178 centimeters tall or 5 foot 10 and there's enough room for me, but I reckon 6.5 feet is probably the limit, even with the manually adjusted seat put all the way down. Backseat passengers have even less room though, so tall people might have to sit in the boot, which at 311 litres is just big enough for a body, although it's more than three times that with the rear seats down, plus the PSC in the E208 is a very respectable 42. But wait, there's even more cool stuff. For example, it has the angry Peugeot kitten, this cool metallic E, a very fashionable claw light cluster, an optional glass roof, 1500 bucks. And you also get a huge range of color options. You've got obviously black, white, and gray, but you've also got red, this blue, and my favorite is Faro Yellow, which for some reason is the only color that's free. It's the best color. But there's also stuff it doesn't come with. For example, no front derriere. You don't get any color interior options either. This black and gray combo is it, and I don't like black and gray, it's boring. So when I come to power, burgundy and brown interiors will be making a comeback. You've been warned. Another thing it doesn't have is a spare tire, just a tire repair kit, and although this model has a tow bar, it's not for towing, just for bike racks. But despite all that, it's still a striking looking car, and I'm really keen to see how it drives. So without further ado, let's hit the road. And we are off, and I should point out that I am not a qualified Peugeotologist, but in my mind, I expected this to be much weirder than it is. I mean, it's weird, it's French. Don't get me wrong, but I expected it to be really avant-garde, and I apologize, I'm going to be using a lot of primary school French in this episode. Unfortunately, everything I learned about France and the French language I learned from a documentary called A Lower Low. But this car is fairly normal. It's very much a cocoon feeling in the car that I haven't had quite as much as any other car I've been in. In the Polestar 2, for example, you sit in the car, but this, this is another level. The whole dashboard, the whole vehicle wraps around you. And it's tight, it's a small car. It's another thing you feel is that it's kind of constrained, but it does lead you to feel sporty. And I kind of want to put my foot down, but it is not a sports car, at least not on paper. You also get driving modes. You have three to choose from, normal, eco, and sport. Let's go into sport mode. Apparently that makes the, oh, okay. Instantly the accelerator is much more responsive. And apparently it also makes the steering a little heavier. A little bit, perhaps. We're gonna test that tomorrow when we take it out to the countryside. The GT version also comes as standard with an automatic dimming rear view mirror and cyclist and pedestrian detection as well. The car also has two modes of regen braking. So a normal mode, if you're in drive and you take your foot off the accelerator, the car only very lightly slows down by itself. But if I press B, I have a little bit more region. But again, it's not enough to enable one pedal driving. You can't take your foot off the accelerator and have the car come to a stop like you can with like a BMW i3, for example. This one does coast even on B mode. It's sort of like regen braking was back 10 years ago. Really, really mild. I love this indicator on the dashboard cluster here sticking out. That's cool. That's different. That's quirky. And if I was to get the car, I'd probably get the sunroof as well, even though this glass roof is $1,500 extra. The acceleration is not epic, but maybe when we put it through its paces in sport mode out in the country, some twisty turny roads, maybe that's where it will shine. Maybe it's just the right amount of braking, just the right amount of power. Maybe I'm reading it all wrong. We'll find out tomorrow. But in the meantime, 
for a city car, it's doing great because I'm in a 50 zone, so I can't go fast anywhere. As I mentioned, this is the GT version, which means it comes with more optional extras and gadgetry, but it doesn't go any faster. It doesn't have more power, which is kind of weird because in my mind, GT, Grand Tour, it means go faster. But no, all of the E208s have the same electric motor, 100 kilowatts peak. It's kind of pointless, like North Dakota. Yeah, maybe I'm being too harsh, so let's hit the country to find out. Bonjour! Today I'm looking forward to hitting the road and seeing what this thing is like on the countryside and on the highway. There's so many more gadgets I haven't had the chance to test yesterday. Today's going to be the day. Let's crack into it. Today we are heading out into the countryside. I'm going to go into the countryside below the Bombay Hills to my secret driving road, which I'm not going to tell you where that is because it is, it's just a fantastic road. And I'm looking forward to seeing how this thing handles. My complaint yesterday was that, hmm, I'm not sure it has enough power. I don't, don't know if the power matches the looks. Well, today we're going to find out if that's the case or not. Perhaps it has just the right amount of power. Something I noticed about this car that's unusual is that the rear vision mirror is well, it's at the top of the windscreen but because of the seating position rather than look up to the mirror I'm just looking to the left. The mirror is right there which means it does obscure part of the windscreen. I do lose a bit of vision uh, in the same way that this pillar is quite thick as well it loses a little bit of vision as well. Okay now let's turn on the adaptive cruise which <laughs> is obscured behind the steering wheel. I cannot see it. Okay, I think. Okay, that's not safe. Cruise control active, 93. Okay, let's. Um, can I increase it a bit? No, that turns it off. Where's the plus button? Activation not possible due to conditions. What conditions? Ah, there we go. I figured it out. Okay, there are like seven buttons on the stalk. <laughs> okay, Peugeot, you need to work on that. Yay, I finally got it operating. Okay, adaptive cruise is set. It's keeping a safe distance between me and the truck. It is going around this corner by itself. My hands are just resting on the wheel. It is comfortable. It's keeping in the lane smoothly and safely. It's not wandering around too much. It's doing a good job. This is a good system. This is a good system. And interestingly, it has cameras in this car that read the speed signs on the side of the road and it shows you the speed on the dashboard. There is also a My Peugeot app you can get for the car, which connects to your phone. It allows you to charge the car remotely, turn on the air conditioning, that sort of stuff. Worth getting if you've got the car. The guessometer that guesses how far we can go per charge says we have 274 k's of range left, which means I've got a fair amount of driving to do today in order to get that range down to justify charging it. As you know, this is the GT version, which means it comes with some options. For example, it has electronic stability control as standard. It has six airbags as standard. It also has adaptive cruise control and lane keeping assist as you saw, uh, speed limit recognition, blind spot detection in the mirrors. It also has a noise generator at low speed, which is not too obtrusive. And it has a six speaker sound system, which I'm going to test very shortly. But what's really interesting to me is I found out last night, after speaking in French all of yesterday, is that, oh, Porsche take car. Wait, that's the one I drove. <laughs> That's the press car. <laughs> anyway, something else that's interesting about this car, and it's a massive missed opportunity on my part, after speaking with a terrible French accent all yesterday, is that this car was actually probably made in Slovakia, in the town of Trnava, which was about an hour away from where I lived. I lived in Slovakia for eight years. So all this time, I was speaking with a French accent, and mal som chansu rozpravat po slovenski. To perdala. I spent the next hour or so driving up and down the Waikato Expressway at speed to eat up as much range as I could. In doing so, I found that the stated range of 382 k's per charge is probably closer to 250 if you're doing a lot of highway flying like I was. And soon enough, I was ready to test the car's charging speed at one of ChargeNet's hyper rapid charges. Okay, pulling into the charger now. Now I can't see on the dashboard a percentage of the battery only a gasometer which says i have 36 k's of range left so maybe what's that 15 percent we'll find out when we plug in and here are the chargers and i'm going to back in because the charge port is on the passenger rear all right let's go charge her up okay Be interesting to see how fast this thing charges let's wave the charge net key fob select my plug this is ccs which is the most common plug type these chargers offer up to 300 kilowatts each. This car supposedly takes up to 100 kilowatts. You take the charger, which is flashing, and plug it in. 
and the fancy equipment does the rest. 14% state of charge right now, 93, 94 kilowatts, 95 kilowatts. That's pretty good. It's sitting about at its peak right now. So now we just wait to see how long it takes to get to 80% and then I'm gonna head out there to the countryside. Not, not the assembly point, behind that. And while the car enjoyed an electric le snack, let me do a cheeky shout out to Ecotricity, which not only makes these videos possible, but also supplies the electricity to all of ChargeNet's high power chargers, with Ecotricity being the only electricity provider in New Zealand which is Carbon Zero certified. Yep, this car is chomping down on nothing but clean Ecotricity power generated right here in New Zealand from only wind, hydro and solar. I mean, seriously, how cool is that? We're living in the future. And if you have an electric car or you're planning on getting one, chuck your address into Ecotricity's EcoSaver plan to see how much money and carbon you can save. Because the EcoSaver plan offers the country's cheapest off-peak carbon zero electricity all weekend, every weekend, plus at selected times during the week too. There's seriously no downside, so come and join the good fight at ecotricity.co.nz. All right, we're at 80% charged. Let's go unplug and carry on. Okay, 81%, 30 minutes up to 81%. All right, I'm gonna stop that cycle and we are done. So an 80% top up takes around 30 minutes on a hyper rapid charger or around seven hours at home on a seven kilowatt wall mounted charger like this one. Now it does come with a granny charger, but I'd not recommend using that because that method would take more than a day to charge. But as I was unplugging the car, someone actually recognized me from one of these corny electric car videos. Oh, you're famous. Oh, I'm not famous. <laughs> I've seen your videos. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're great. It's the first time I've ever been recognized. I don't know how to handle it. I'd rather have the fame and fortune part without the fame part. I'd just rather have the fortune, thanks. <laughs> anyway, let us hit the road. Okay, we are charged. We are at 81%. Now it's time to zip down and go have some fun on the countryside. I'm looking forward to this part. And as I approached my top secret driving road, it turned out to be worth the wait, with this little car handling quite well in the corners despite its mass. Time to put it into sport mode. All right, maximum region. Okay, let's have some fun. Let's chuck it into this corner. Oh, that, it feels like it's gonna wallow out of it, but then when, you, when it gets into the guts of the corner, it hangs on tight. It's deceptive suspension. What's interesting is this car is only 1.45 tons, and for an electric car, that's really light. It's lighter than the Tesla Model 3 standard range. It's lighter than the MG ZS EV. It's, it's about 160 kilograms lighter than a Subaru Legacy, and the center of gravity in this is lower than it is in a Subaru Legacy. So in theory, it should handle as well. Of course, it comes down to the suspension and the suspension feels maybe it's a little wallowy. Oh no, maybe not, it's deceptive. You throw it into a corner and you think, oh, it's not liking that. But then when you expect it to give up, oh, it, it, oh, okay, that hangs on tight. Okay, maybe this car has redeemed itself. This is a fun little car. It could probably do with a few more kilowatts, but otherwise it's pretty good. Sacre bleu. And what we've all been waiting for, finally, the zero to a hundred time. <laughs> I don't expect this to be spectacular, so. Let's do it. It doesn't have launch control, so let's just go for it. You ready? Three, two, one. Ooh, a little chirpy on the wheels. Okay. It's kind of, it's a perfect city car because it's comfortable, it's sensible, it's small, and yet it projects a lot. And everyone in Auckland, for example, they're all projecting that they're richer and faster and more successful than they are. But in actual fact, it's a sensible, safe, practical car. But no one else needs to know that. From the outside, 
It's a rocket ship. And there you have it. The Peugeot E208 might look like a hot hatch inside and out, but it's actually quite a sensible, inoffensive, practical city car that also enjoys a light thrashing on the weekends. All in all, as the French say, it is agréable.